So tonight we come to Ruth chapter 2. Ruth chapter 2. Ruth is found right after the book of Judges and right before the book of 1 Samuel. It's close to the beginning of the Bible. Small book, only four chapters. We treated Ruth 1 last week, and tonight we will read chapter 2 in its entirety. It's on page 413 if you want to follow along in your pew Bibles. Otherwise, the words will be on the screen. Ruth 2, beginning at verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabitess, said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they called back. Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, Whose young woman is that? And the foreman replied, She is the Moabitess who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She went into the field and has worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She exclaimed, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I have been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother in your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have given me comfort and have spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not know, though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men. Even if she gathers among the sheaves, don't embarrass her. Rather, pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing kindness to the living and the dead. She added, That man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabites said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with his girls because in someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the servant girls of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as we began the book of Ruth last week, we were introduced to a family from Judah living in Bethlehem. But then when a famine hit, they hit the road and ended up in Moab. Moab. 
During their 10 years in Moab, the, the husband of the matriarch died. The two sons married, and then they too died. And all that were left were a mother-in-law and two daughters-in-law. Now, when Naomi heard that the famine was finally over, she made the decision to return home to Israel. And when she did, she told her daughters-in-law to, to just return to their homes. But, but one of them, Ruth, who we read about today, pledged her devotion to Naomi and to Naomi's people and to Naomi's God. The end of chapter one ended like this. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. And when they hit town again, the women of Bethlehem asked, whoa, is this Naomi? But Naomi responded to them, don't call me Naomi. Don't call me sweetness any longer. Call me Mara instead. Call me bitterness because of what God has done to me. And so you remember from last week that Ruth chapter one presents us with this story that has nowhere to go but down. Two widows, one of them a foreigner, no prospects, no security, no safety, no standing. But, and here's where some more of the background comes in, God never intended for it to be this way. He never intended for it to be this way in his country, in his land, in the promised land. As a matter of fact, God had actually made provision for just this type of situation. When God, through Moses, laid out the structure and function of Israelite society, he included this command from Leviticus 19, verses 9 and 10. This is God's command. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Now, in the situation we have here in the book of Ruth, if the poor and the alien could count on obedience to this command by God's people, they could know that they would be provided for in God's society. And so we might ask at this point, what makes Naomi and Ruth's situation so dire? Well, in response, and here's where more of the background comes in, I want to provide the context for the entire book of Ruth, and I want to just do this for a couple of minutes. If you remember from chapter 1, the first line of chapter 1 reads, in the time when the judges ruled. Now this gives us an approximate timeline from 1350 BC to uh, 1079 BC. This is the time period between the, the death of Joshua and the kingship of Saul, which of course led into the kingship of David. And so Ruth lived during the time of the judges, and this is what it was like. This is an excerpt from Judges chapter 2. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They provoked the Lord to anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. In his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. They were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshiped them. Unlike their fathers, they quickly turned from the way in which their fathers had walked, the way of obedience 
to the Lord's commands. And so this was a time period in Israel that was characterized by this vicious cycle. The people would turn away fully from God and his ways. They would get into trouble and things would go bad. They would cry out to God. So God would raise up a judge to bring them out of whatever present calamity they had gotten themselves into. Then the judge would eventually pass away or lose influence in society. And then the people would turn away from God again and go back to their evil ways. The cycle would play out again and again and again and again. So this is the period that we're talking about. One step forward, two steps back. Judges 21 verse 25 sums it up well. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. And so do you see how Ruth and Naomi's survival depended on whether or not this was a time period where people were following the Lord and his commands. If they found people living in obedience to God, then there was hope for them. But if they found that people had turned away from God, they were in big trouble. Because again, this is two widows One a foreigner, no prospects, no security, no safety, no standing, completely dependent upon God's providence and the obedience of his people. But just as Ruth chapter 1 paints a picture that couldn't get much worse, Ruth 2 paints a picture of good fortune that is nothing short of amazing. And it all begins with God. Naomi and Ruth had entered Bethlehem with nothing. So what would they do? How could they even eat? Well, as I mentioned a couple minutes ago, God in his infinite love and wisdom had made provision for them in his law. A plan that would protect the orphan and the widow, the poor and the alien. Farmers were commanded not to pick their fields bare during the harvest. They had to leave the corners of their property and and couldn't um, harvest more than one pass through a given field or vineyard. And this would leave enough leftovers for any poor people that needed food. Now, sadly, we've seen this throughout history. We see it in plenty of areas today as well. It seems to be hardwired into humanity's fallen nature to either ignore or exploit the helpless. And this is precisely why God made this provision. Zechariah 7 verse 9 says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. In your hearts, do not think evil of each other. See, the Lord's desire is that we not curse, but rather we bless those who are in need. Deuteronomy 15 verse 11 says, there will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your brothers and toward the poor and needy in your land. Now, at the same time, the Lord does not just want to provide for those in need. He also wants to empower those who are in need. After all, they too were to have dignity and value in the society in which they lived. And therefore, his provision encouraged and required productive labor. This is a principle that carries over into the New Testament as well. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. And so, during the time of Ruth, the widow, the orphan, the poor, the alien, earned their food by gathering it themselves. And this law stands as a perfect balance between God's love for the poor and his desire that we work and be productive in the place where he has planted us. Well, 
Ruth volunteered to go and gather grain to provide for herself and Naomi. Verse 3 says, she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. Harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Do you see how God is working behind the scenes here? I love that phrase in verse 3, as it turned out. She just happens to end up in Boaz's field. As it turned out. Literally, if you read it in the Hebrew, it reads, as chance chanced, as luck would have it, fortunately, coincidentally, come to find out, Ruth just happens to end up in the field of one of Naomi's relatives, a potential redeemer of her family line. Well, Let me just assure you, the author of Ruth knows very well that there are no coincidences with God. When he writes, as it turned out, he is using irony to direct our attention to God's providential care. Yes, God is alive and well and working in Naomi and Ruth's situation. Ruth just happens to end up in Boaz's fields. I think that's a funny choice of words because although we tend to see things as coincidences sometimes or the luck of the draw, we don't find the words luck or coincidence in the Bible anywhere. Instead, the Bible tells us in places like Proverbs that in his, ma- in his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. Elsewhere it says, a man's steps are directed by the Lord. How then can anyone understand his own way? Now, I don't know how God works all these things out. But because Scripture says so, I trust that he does. I don't understand how we have a free will to go where we want to go and do what we want to do, but somehow God guides us into the right field. Somehow God leads us to precisely the spot where he wants us to be. And I want you to understand here, there is a lot riding on Ruth's choice of where to glean, where to go to work. If she hadn't chosen Boaz's field, uh, she and Boaz never would have met. King David and, and King Solomon would not have been born because this is the family line through which they come which means that Jesus wouldn't have been born in Bethlehem. All of this is riding on where Ruth decides to glean in her fields. Chance, luck, coincidence, I don't believe it for a second. See, God is working behind the scenes, and that's one of the things that I love about this story because most of our own experiences are a lot like this. Seemingly coincidences. Stumbling into good fortune that we could never have predicted. Meeting people that change our lives. There are no miracles here in Ruth. There's no angelic messengers. There's no voice of God from heaven. And yet, behind it all, God is at work, caring for Naomi and Ruth, guiding Ruth to just the right spot, just the right field to do her gleaning. I want to pause and just take a moment to ask you, how about you? Do you see God's guiding hand in your life? Do you see his constant care? Do you see his providential kindness? Brothers and sisters, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you can be sure of it. Scripture proclaims it over and over again. God is in control, and God is working for the greatest good of his people. God is working for your greatest good. But I also want you to notice, and this gets into a bit of the application Just because God is at work caring and guiding 
doesn't mean that we just sit back and do nothing. You know, it was interesting in my reading for this sermon, I came across one commentator who wrote, resist the temptation to moralize Ruth's industrial nature, her courageous spirit, and her wherewithal bravery to go into the field to glean. To do so would be to cheapen the work of God in this story. I don't agree. I don't agree. I am a both and sort of guy, and I think that this story and this chapter within the story highlights one of the great tensions of the Christian life, and that is the tension between God's sovereignty and human responsibility. I think Ruth's action is important. And I think that it is a model for us. And I don't think that it minimizes God's involvement in the least. See, Ruth doesn't just wait around and wait for provision to drop down from heaven. She's active and she's thoughtful and she's purposeful as she makes this decision to glean. She asks Naomi's permission. She looks for a place to work. And it's very obvious from what it says in Ruth chapter 2 that she works hard. She only took one break during the day. And so we see here, not only did Ruth turn her back on her former life and pledge herself to the one true God... Her decision here to lean into his divinely ordained system shows that she is all in. She is a woman of great faith and great trust. And anything that God had established in Israel, she was going to be a part of. And so she participates in this system throwing herself at the mercy of God and his people that she would be provided for. Now, when one person does something like that, God blesses their active faith. When two or more people join in together in this kind of work, leaning into God's will and purposes and systems and ways of doing things, lives start to change exponentially. And when a community or a church leans all into God's will and purposes, brothers and sisters, that can change the world. When Boaz arrives to work in verse 4, we, along with Ruth, are immediately put at ease. He greets his men, the Lord be with you. And they respond, the Lord bless you. Boaz quickly notices Ruth and asks about her and approaches her. And his words to her in verse 8, I think, are incredible. He says, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I have told my men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jar the men have filled. Kindness, provision, status, security, Everything that Ruth lacked coming into chapter two, God provides for her through the kind words and kind actions of Boaz. See, Boaz too is a man who is all in to God's will and God's purposes. And he enters this story as an agent of God's goodness in the world. As a result, by the end of the chapter, Ruth is just drowning in God's blessings. She's invited to a feast. She's allowed to glean in the sheaves. Boaz tells his workers to pull out stalks for her to make her work easier. By the time Ruth gets home, she is carrying an ephah of barley. That's a month's wages. Brothers and sisters, We are not promised riches in this life. 
But what Jesus does promise is that every person who comes to him receives every spiritual blessing. Love, forgiveness, his presence, his life, his hope, and the future. Trust in Jesus and you will greet each new day with the knowledge that God will provide. And so we come together like this, gathering in worship. We hear God's word, we participate in the sacraments. We put into practice what the Bible teaches us. We pray, we plan, we act, and God blesses because his desire is to provide everything we need in Christ unto salvation. Amen. Let's bow our heads.